It's a, like giving you a toolbox full of stuff that you can take home and work on your station with. Everybody's circumstances are different. When I wrote the original columns about this stuff, it generated more correspondence than any other column in 15 years. And a lot of it was people asking about their specific circumstances. I've got this shack, it's on the second floor, I got this, you know. And people want to be told exactly what to do. You can't quite do that. But I can give you a good toolbox and a good understanding of terms. You've got a little book, you've got lots of online standards and stuff, and you can do it right. I'm going to show you how taking a systems approach to the whole thing, looking at all the different requirements, helps you understand that I can do this once and it'll work for all of them. You don't have to have four separate grounding and bonding systems. You do this right once and satisfy all of these requirements. And then I'm going to point you at more comprehensive resources. So if you really want to spend some money, <laughs> you can go do it. But the source of information, these are out there. They're online. They're free. And you can really get a lot out of them. OK, who is this for? Station builders. OK, if you're just starting out, I don't think that's this crowd in particular. But you know, maybe you're starting to build a first station, uh, a remote station, or something like that. Maybe you're putting up a first tower. You've run wire antennas and whatnot, and you've finally gotten around to putting up that first big tower. You're expanding your station. What contester is not expanding their station? You know, it's like everybody's putting up temporary antennas. You know, you know what the, the word temporary means? means until I die. Okay, so temporary antennas. Maybe you just moved to lightning country. I moved from Seattle, where lightning is so rare that they write about it in the paper, to Missouri, where it's just like a way of life. You know, my new station that I built on Crawford County uh, is, is what I refer to as the Crawford County Cumulonimbus Discharge Facility. Okay. <clears throat> and it, I know it's been hit already. When I moved there, there are all these unfortunate trees with burn marks on them. George, uh, he was here for the earlier talk, K5KG. He lives in Fiesta Key, uh, which is near Tampa. And they have intense and frequent, everyday lightning storms. His single point ground panel is a work of art. Maybe you're just trying for better performance. And you notice that you have to move things around and ground stuff or unground stuff or whatever you call it. Um, and you, you say, how does this work better? I've got RFI. I've got hotspots. OK, it's not for K3LR, LPL, XX. Those guys have enormous stations with much bigger fish to fry, uh, so to speak, than us little guys. OK, so it's for us little guys. Here's your background reference. There's more stuff about grounding and bonding in the ARL handbook. I made sure, as the editor, that we updated all the safety stuff. And the antenna book, too, there's more stuff in there. This book, Grounding and Bonding, has just gotten legs. It's been reviewed by some really good, solid people, uh, to who I, I am indebted for keeping me from saying stupid things in public. Okay, I'm not a grounding and bonding expert, per se. I'm not trained in that. I, I'm an electrical engineer. I've learned about all this stuff. And my function here is to collect all this stuff together, because it was out, spread out in all these different resources, and they talked as if the others didn't exist. Radio amateurs have a unique kind of a uh, situation. We have RF. We have RF at low frequencies. We have RF at very high frequencies. We have AC safety concerns. We have all these different concerns, but the information was sprinkled around. So I tried to collect the good stuff and put it in a book for you. The NEC handbook. Get the handbook, the big thick one, not the, the little one that just lists the code. The, the code is great with a bunch of rules, but they don't tell you much about the rules. The handbook, the big thick one, gives you pictures and text and rationale and shows you how to do stuff right and when certain things apply and when they don't apply. It's at your library. You can copy out two or three of the articles, and they call chapters articles. Copy them out, take them home. Okay, And that's listed in the books as well. The, the big one that's online for free, Motorola R56, standards and guidelines for communication sites, you don't have the budget they do, okay? But you can see how they do things, and you can say, you know, I could do something sort of like that. So it's a guideline-type document. Available online, there are three really good articles about lightning protection by Ron Block, who's one of the Polyphaser brothers, and they're on the ARL website. The ARL website has a whole lot of stuff about grounding, 
lightning, RFI, stuff like that. People have no idea how much stuff there is in the technical information service. So go to the ARL website, look up Ron's three-part articles about lightning protection. And then if you're familiar with K9YC, uh, his stuff about ferrites and other things, he's written some really good stuff. The site's full of tutorials. Power, grounding, bonding, and audio for amateur radio and RFI. Great free tutorial PDF document. And then common mode chokes for hams. Um, those are available at K9YC.com. Okay, so let's talk about what ground is. The right answer depends on what you're trying to do. When I worked as a systems engineer for a large medical company, I used to carry this little card in my pocket, and people would ask me some question. I'd pull it out and say, it depends. Okay, there's, you cannot give a straight answer to people the way they want. You have to understand the context and the environment and what are they trying to accomplish and what frequency are we talking about here? Are we talking about AC, where the wavelength is like 50,000 meters? Are we talking about microwaves, where it's in millimeters? What? It depends on frequency. It depends on the voltages that we're talking about. Audio guys worry about millivolts, okay? What about current? Lightning guys care about kilo amps. I don't know about you, but kilo amps frighten me, okay? Um, I'm, I'm a milliamp kind of a guy. I don't, I don't want kilo amps in my station. Well, Mr. Lightning deals with kilo amps, okay? Uh, depends. Are we just talking about leakage current? Or are we talking about lightning strikes? What? Your safety depends on the right answer. You know, you've got these big lightning attractors outside. You want your station to be safe. You want your home to be safe. You want to be protected from lightning. You want to be protected from AC safety hazards, all these different things. Your equipment depends on the right answer. People talk all the time, oh, I took a lightning hit, blew out all my stuff. I went over to K9SD one time to do a sprint, and uh, he had, I knew that he had taken some kind of a lightning hit. His wife says, oh, Sam's in the basement. I go down there. What I see is Sam and his big plumber's crack hanging out from under the, the operating position, swearing. And <laughs> I said, hi, Sam. And he goes, here, take this. And he hands me another Array Solutions box and uh, says, uh, put a big piece of tape on it. It says, bad, damn it. You know, uh, he had just, you know, all kinds of stuff had gotten fried. So we want your equipment to survive this stuff. Your sanity depends on the right answer. Let me tell you, you can chase your tail. If you don't understand the meanings of the word and the techniques and what you're trying to do, you can chase your tail for months trying to solve an RFI problem or some kind of feedback problem or something like that. So we're going to try to get the definition straight so you can always go back to point zero and work it through. Ground can be a noun, a verb, and an adjective all at the same time. Okay, I grounded my station with a ground connection to a ground rod, you know, and you're using the word over and over and over again. That was another thing I learned as a systems guy, is you can hear people having a conversation, and they're both nodding up and down, and you listen to both of them talking, and you realize they're talking about completely different things. Okay, grounding is exactly that way. It can be a noun when you talk about an earth connection. And the British have gotten rid of the word grounding entirely. They call it earthing. Okay, when they mean a connection to the earth, they call it a connection to the earth. Okay, that helps. Um, it could be a local reference potential. Well, the ground of an op amp circuit is just the minus of your power supply. It may be the ground plane or whatever. It can be anything from a connection to the earth to a tiny little tie point inside of a circuit. It can be a verb where it's an action to connect something to the reference voltage. I'm going to ground this op amp pin. I'm going to ground my tower. That means you're connecting something to a reference voltage. It can be an adjective. Ground conductor, ground system, ground lead. Okay, So you need to understand how you're using the term and use it judiciously uh, to mean exactly what you mean it to mean. And there are fuzzy definitions. We've got to stop using the term RF ground. There ain't no such animal. There is no single point of contact that is at zero volts at RF at all frequencies. It doesn't happen. Okay, the best you can do is make things the same voltage. And even the Earth is not an equipotential surface. You can't just 
pour RF into the earth and expect it to go away. It doesn't work like that. Ground loops, they're not the problem you think they are. Every time you hear somebody with buzz or hum, there's some guy will jump in on frequencies. Yeah, well, sounds like you got a ground loop there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, well, ground loops make sense at AC, okay? You can have these ground loops where you pick up magnetic fields from a power transformer. Who remembers setting one of their CRTs near a fan in an amplifier and having the, uh, you know, the display go <laughs> and, until you move the CRT away? Magnetic fields induce voltages in loops of conductors. But that's really only a problem at power type fields and wiring and stuff. Power transformers, AC circuits and stuff like that. If you hear a hum, a true hum, which is a sine wave at a low frequency, then you might have a loop that's picking up a magnetic field. Otherwise, it's something else. And it's rarely an issue at RF. Ham shacks have hundreds, literally hundreds, of loops of cable and connections between enclosures, all the shields of our connectors, everything else makes the loop. Anytime you have a continuous path through some connections, you have a ground loop. So it's really not the problem you think it might be. When you talk to somebody about single point ground, if you talk to an electrician, what's the wavelength at uh, AC? 50,000 meters. Single point means small, short, compact with respect to a wavelength, okay? So a football stadium can be a single point ground at AC, not literally, but you know, it can be something very, very big. Whereas at 20 meters, a single point ground needs to be a few feet, maybe, maybe even smaller than that. And at VHF, single point means something about this big. Okay, so when we talk about single point ground, it matters whether you're talking about AC power, whether you're talking about lightning protection, which is a wide spectrum event that goes from a few hundred kilohertz all the way up to 10 megahertz. It, well, it goes from DC to 10 megahertz. So single point to Mr. Lightning means a lot of different things. And single point for your RF means something else as well. Okay, let's talk about bonding. I'm bonding with you right now. Okay, we're all bonding together here at, the, at CTU. Okay, electrical bonding, all it means is a connection that's intended to keep two points at the same voltage. And that's the same thing at AC and at RF and at microwaves and everything else. It's just a connection that keeps everything at the same voltage. That's all you're trying to do is keep stuff at the same voltage. If it's at the same voltage, will current flow between it? No. And that's the important thing because RF currents and stuff flowing between pieces of equipment are what cause RFI and hot spots and other things, okay? So you want to keep everything at the same voltage so that you don't have these hot spots. So you don't have current flowing into your audio circuits and getting into your microphones and all sorts of stuff. It sounds real expensive, like you've got to get special clamps or you have to weld your transmitter to the ground rod or something like that. No. All it means is a, a solid, low impedance connection. That can be heavy wire, it can be strap. At field day, it can be a clip lead, for crying out loud, okay? But the idea is you're just making a connection that is sufficient to keep two things at the same voltage for the voltage, the frequency, and the current that you're trying to deal with. It's not hard either. I mean, you can make it as hard as you want, but basically all it is is good, solid grounding conductors connecting things together. It requires, though, you have to use the right connecting materials and hardware. Heavy enough wire, short, low impedance connections between pieces of equipment. And bonding is good across the spectrum. It works at AC, it works at, for lightning, it works for RF. So it's a good thing. Learn how to do it. Uh, make it a standard practice. It has to be low impedance, that means electrically short at the frequencies of interest. We've all heard the tales about how a ground wire that's a quarter wavelength long is a infinite impedance because of how impedance repeats along electrically long conductors, okay? So it has to be low Z. That typically means it has to be heavy, low inductance, okay? So at RF, you don't get inductive reactance in that uh, conductor, whatever it is. And it has to be short enough so that you don't get into transmission line effects. And it may be low impedance over here, but high impedance over here. So 
it has to, when I talk about heavy enough to carry the expected current, if you're just talking about a few milliamps of AC leakage current, a calipolite will do. If you're talking about typical RF levels in a station, well, maybe a piece of number 14, okay? If you're talking about um, bonding things that might be hit by Mr. Lightning, you have to use big, heavy stuff. You have to use strap. You have to use heavy, solid wire. It has to be secured with ground clamps. It has to be bolted onto things. The mechanical forces associated with a lightning strike are awesome. Hundreds of pounds per feet. You can see conductors, they get hit by these big current pulses and they'll just rip themselves out of the wall. Things like that. Just from the forces of the current that are causing magnetic fields. It's pretty amazing stuff. So if you're talking about lightning, use what the pros tell you to use. If we're talking about RF management in the shack, we're talking about AC safety, it's not such a big deal. AC safety conductors have to be heavy enough that if there's a short or a fault, it will trip the protective device. Blow the fuse, trip the breaker. That's why it has to be as big as the conductors that are in the cable. So you get 14, 14, 14, you get 12, 12, 12, whatever. The ground conductor has to be heavy enough to, to do that, and it has to be sturdy enough to survive the environment. Outside, you bury your stuff, and you forget that it's there, and somebody digs it up with a shovel or, you know, Mr. Rototiller or whatever. It has to be heavy enough to survive that kind of mechanical abuse so that it doesn't disappear on you when you need it. Inside your station, people always say, what do I use? What do I use? You're talking about all these things. Okay, use strap, 20-gauge copper or aluminum strap that you can cut from flashing or you can buy in rolls. Use heavy wire, number 14 or larger. Strip out some junk Romax. That's fine. Works great. Doesn't matter whether it's solid or stranded. Both of them will work about equally well. If you have to use braid, if you use the flat weave braid, the silver tin stuff that you can buy in flat rolls, that's the stuff to use. Um, do not use the stuff from old coax. Don't strip the jacket off and use the braid. Why? Because that braid is designed to be protected by the jacket from water, and it also compresses all those tiny little connectors, uh, the conductors together, so they keep um, connected to each other. The minute you take that jacket off, you expose the raw copper to oxygen, which corrodes it, and all the other nasty things that you have, water, which is, we all know is bad, and it loosens up. That's how you get it off the center conductor, don't you? You kind of loosen it up a little bit and strip it out. Okay, that means the connections between all those little conductors are no longer good. So what you wind up with is a degrading piece of contact stuff. And it can generate noise, it can cause all sorts of problems. So don't do it. If you want to use old coax as a grounding conductor, leave the jacket on. Twist the grounding stuff at each end, use it as big fat wire. And do not use braid outside or anywhere it can be exposed to water or corrosive chemicals. Even the, the flat weave stuff will not work there. The standard in commercial installations is 20 gauge strap. Get some, use it, and save that old Romax that we never throw away because we might need it someday. Okay, this is good for grounding. Safety, safety, safety. I mean, every, everybody says, oh yeah, safety. We're manly kind of guys. We don't need this safety crap. Uh, and we ignore all the safety instructions and a lot of things kind of overdo it on the safety instructions. Don't be the guy that said, I didn't think it would happen to me. Okay, follow the rules. You won't regret it. And your authority having jurisdiction, whatever that is, the county, the city, your landlord, uh, the local code, it's law, okay? And that can affect liability, it can affect insurance, a bunch of other things. Follow the code. Even if the code diverges from NEC, follow the local code. There may be reasons, really good reasons, for why the local code is different. You may have soil characteristics, you may have power system characteristics, you may have any number of things that cause you to have to do something special in order to be safe. So follow the rules. And if you don't know what you're doing, oh, I'm sorry, I said the bad words for men, don't know what you're doing. You know, uh, we don't want to admit that we don't know what we're doing, okay? But sometimes we don't, all right? This book 
is available at Home Depot. It's available online. It costs 20 bucks. Best 20 bucks you'll spend. Shows you how to do everything in your house. How to connect appliances. How to do that weird four wire thing. How to connect to your circuit breaker box. How to uh, ground stuff. How when you don't ground stuff. All these different things in this book. Or we could always hire a professional electrician to come in and do it right. But Know what you're doing, or find out, or hire somebody that does. AC safety grounding. It has several names depending on where you are in the country and how old the electrician are uh, that you're talking to. It can be equipment ground. That is the new official term that you'll see in the NEC. But it's also commonly referred to as third wire ground, green wire ground. It's that wire that goes back to the circuit breaker box. It has two purposes and two purposes only. One is it provides the path back to the AC common point for your power system if you have a fault. Short circuit, leakage current, it's a safe path back to the reference voltage in your house or your vehicle, or I'm sorry, or your building or your residence, whatever. It stabilizes the AC power voltage during faults or transients like lightning or the guy hits a pole down the street and knocks the phases together or something and all these ground connections, your ground rod at your house and that wire that comes down the pole and goes around the butt of the pole into the ground, the thousands of connections stabilize the power system voltage. That's the only thing those are for. It has nothing to do with RF. That's it. Here's your AC power. I think most of us have dealt with this to a certain extent. You have a, a utility transformer. It has a secondary with two windings uh, that are center tap. The center tap has a wire that goes down to the bottom of the pole. That's your local ground. Um, and that's also your neutral that comes to your house. This is two-phase residential wiring. And you've got two phases, and they come to the main breakers that disconnect things from your circuit breaker box. There is a neutral bus on the left, and there's a ground bus on the right. Those are not tied together as it comes from the store. If this is your primary uh, box, you want to have a main bonding jumper that goes between neutral and ground. And then from the ground, you have a connection to your local grounding electrode. That's the official term for that. So you need to have a ground rod outside the house. The ground part is mounted directly on the metal of the box. If you have a box and you go home now and you open up your box and you unscrew the panel and you look in there, and you do not see a main bonding jumper, or you do not see a connection to a ground rod, you need to talk to an electrician. And I live, uh, I'm building the station in Crawford County where they have no building requirements whatsoever, none. There's only one, and that is you cannot poop directly into a stream. That's it. And they will write you a letter to that effect. That is the only rule, okay? My house didn't have a grounding conductor. It didn't have a butt wrap on the pole. It didn't have anything, okay? This is rural Missouri. If it didn't burn down, it's okay, all right? So I've had to install a lot of stuff. And I asked my electrician, would it be okay, you know, if I put a, a extra ground rods outside? And he looked at me and says, can't have too many grounds, you know? So, you know, it's just a thing you need to pay attention to. You assume, especially if you live in an older house, that this is all done correctly. It might not be. And that has a big effect on lightning protection and AC safety. If you do put in your ground rods, this is the way to do it. They want two now, not just one, because the one is single point of failure, right? You hit it with the lawnmower, suddenly your house is ungrounded. You have two ground rods, use the right kind of clamps. The one on the left is called a GC style ground clamp and it has a little screw terminal on the top so you can stick in a big ground wire. It'll handle up to number two. Um, and then the one on the right is called an acorn clamp. These are rated. You go to Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever and you buy these bronze clamps and make sure that if you're going to bury them, they're rated for burial. If, you're not say, if they don't say rated for burial, you're not supposed to bury them. Okay, leave them up in the air where you can see them. Ground rods should be no closer than how deep they are and typically uh, about six feet apart. How many people have done a CAD weld? Isn't it fun? Oh, fire is good. Uh, fire burn. Okay, this is a picture of uh, 
uh, the uh, result of a CAD weld thing. I got my tower, got ground radials that go out into the dirt, number two copper, and I went and got some of these uh, CAD welds. Uh, DX Engineering sells them. They're eight or nine bucks a piece. You get the right size, you've got to have the right size cubicle. They have to be exactly right, but boy, are they fun. You put the little cubicle on there, it's fill it with the magic powder, and then you stick in your wires, and then you put the igniter on the top, you put the lid on top of that, and then you spark it. Sparklers also work, and then you get an extra bonus firework, too. And I thought, if you go to uh, KF7P and look at his YouTubes, he's got a YouTube of how you do this. And I thought, he must have speeded up that part where it, where it melts. No, it takes about a second and a half. You light that stuff off, and it goes, whoa, like that. And suddenly, you've got molten metal at 2,000 degrees dripping out of holes and stuff. It's cool. Plan on, on screwing one up, okay? So buy an extra one, and then go out. And when you do this, you can bury them. They work forever. You'll never have to dig them up or look at them when you do them right. Good stuff. Bond all of your earth connections together. The cable guy comes. He puts in a ground rod. The telephone guys, they have a ground rod. The AC service guy, he's got a ground rod. You've got a ground rod outside your shack because the handbook told you to. Okay, they're all different. Are they connected together? Well, sort of, okay, by, by dirt. How conductive is dirt? Not very, okay? So you've got like a 20, 30, 50 ohm resistor between all of your ground rods. Is that gonna tie things together when Mr. Lightning comes for a visit? It is not. Okay, so you need to get a roll of that number six or number two or whatever you got. Whatever your brother-in-law has from his last construction job, get a roll of that stuff. Connect all of your ground rods together and put in extra ground rods. This is called a perimeter ground. Goes If you can go all the way around your house, terrific. If you can't go all the way around the house because of the driveway or something, uh, go as far as you can. Put ground rods every eight to 10 feet, okay? That gives you an extra connection, and all of your grounds are together. And so when Mr. Lightning comes for a visit, everybody goes up and down together. It's like a floating dock, okay? When the big wave comes, the dock and the boats and everything go up and down together. If some of the dock is tied down and some of the dock isn't, it tears up the dock. It busts off the boats. You have trouble. Let it all go up and down together. And you do that by bonding all of your earth connections together. Okay, Mr. Lightning. You can't steer Mr. Lightning. Mr. Lightning will go where Mr. Lightning wants to go. And where does Mr. Lightning want to go? The earth, okay? You can help Mr. Lightning make good decisions about how he gets there, okay? So we're going to help him do that. How do you do that? By making heavy, low impedance paths to the earth for Mr. Lightning, okay? Make it easy for him to go. I'm gonna go through that big strap and those ground rods and your buried ground radial system. I'm gonna go there. I'm not gonna go through your shack and your TV and your phone and your wireless router and all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna go this other way. When you're talking about lightning protection, inductance is the most important thing. Inductance, the voltage you can get between just one foot of wire under a typical lightning strike is hundreds of volts. Voltage is equal to inductance times the change in current per unit time. And if we're talking about kilo amps per microsecond, it doesn't take very much L to multiply that value and get a fairly significant voltage. Voltage appearing in different places is what causes the destructive arcs and currents to flow in your station and your house. So low impedance l means low inductance in the case of lightning. Make all these paths go outside your house. Don't invite Mr. Lightning inside and expect him not to wreck a bunch of stuff on the way. Make it easy for him to go outside the house, into the earth, disperse the charge. That's what you're talking about. That's what he wants to do. Help him do it. Don't make it easy for Lightning to go through the house. Here's why. This is a, a drawing, okay, so you got your AC power system over on the right, you got your lightning attractor known as an amateur radio tower on the left, and you've got a nice ground rod there, your, your nice little outside entry panel goes to your radios, that's hooked up through the power system uh, to your AC service. Okay, Mr. Lightning comes and hits the 
antenna. What happens? It comes down the tower, it comes along the uh, cables, and some of them will go into the ground at your external ground panel. But there's this other path through your house, a fine path through the radios, through your power supply, through your AC system to get to that ground rod. Terrific, Mr. Lightning doesn't care. And on the way, it destroys a bunch of stuff, wrecks your radio, blows up your TV, all these kind of things. Don't, you don't want to do that. You want to have this external system with lots and lots and lots of ground rods, radials, stuff that's buried, lots of uh, conductor buried in the earth. So when Mr. Lightning comes along, say he hits the power system, which is actually much more probable, he comes to your service entry, what does he see? He sees that path through the house, but he says, oh, man. This is a great set of connections, a lot of ground rods, low impedance, low inductance, I'm going there. Okay, and inside, you've got everything tied together. Remember, they all go up and down together so that one piece of equipment isn't at 8,000 volts and the other one is at zero. That's what the problem is. So outside, construct a perimeter ground with lots of ground rods, tie it all together, and every place service comes into the house, tie it to that system. Here's your standard tower grounding, looking down on the tower. Mostly, I think everybody knows that you have to have a ground rod at the tower. And you should have one for each leg, because you never know where the lightning is going to concentrate itself. So then you tie them all together with the ground ring. I got a big chunk of tinned number two wire. It wasn't cheap, but it wasn't that expensive either. And if you root around, you can sometimes find surplus and tag ends and stuff like that. We're not talking about wiring a commercial facility here. We're just talking about ham safety. So we don't need hundreds and hundreds of feet of this stuff. If you want to go the extra mile, and if you live in a lightning country like I do, you dig like a 30-foot trench or a slit trench or something like that, and you run some more radials out along this, and you put in some ground rods. That's where I use the CAD welds, and you bury it all. So now you've got these nice paths for charge dispersal. If you talk to the cable or um, uh, cell phone guys that put up these towers and stuff, a lot of them are on mountains where they have rocks and things. And so how, do you, how do you ground these things? Radial systems. We just spread the charge. We just dissipate the charge. And we get a lot more mileage out of that than we do trying to pound in ground rods. So if you have a compromised um, ground, area, soil, we've got rocks and all this kind of stuff. Ground radials will do it. This is an excellent way to ground a tower. Bond your feed lines to the tower. Remember what I said, L, D, I, D, T, okay? You can get 100,000 volts between an unbonded feed line and a grounded tower if you don't bond them together. I don't know too many coax jackets that are rated for 100,000 volts. Okay, so what happens? What happens? Well, you get arcs from the outside of the coax, the shield, to through the jacket to the tower leg. And so you get these pinholes or slits in your jacket. And so even if it doesn't blow up the stuff inside the coax, suddenly you've got water in there. You've got an arced point. You've got damage. Okay, so the solution here is to bond your feed lines to the tower every 50 or 60 feet. You've got a real tall one every 50 or 60 feet. Yes, it's a pain in the ass, okay? But it keeps your feed line at the same potential as your tower all the way down, okay? That's important. This is a DXE product. It's a nice little galvanized clamp that you can put on a tower leg, and it's got holes for these little bulkhead things. You can also buy nice little cable grounding kits from Andrews and other places online, eBay, uh, Amazon, and they're just basically little straps. At some point, you have to open up the jacket, you have to make a good connection to that, that shield, and you have to tie that to the tower. And then you have to, you know, uh, waterproof it all again. You'll get real good at it, but uh, bond your stuff to the tower. If you've got an insulated tower, minor insulated uh, in Missouri, what I made is a spark gap. Um, this is a picture from Tom, W-H-A-I, over on the right. Tom's got a 300-foot tower on a hilltop in uh, on a mountaintop in Georgia. You think he knows about lightning? Yeah, he does. He's got a great website about that, too. All, what's that question? Okay. All Tom did was down at the bottom of the tower where he's got his base flange, he took a piece of regular old 
copper pipe, hooked it up to his ground radials and all that kind of stuff, and he just bent it until it was close to the flange. Made a little spark gap. We've all read about using spark plugs for open wire line at our grounding panels, you know, and we, we gap them down to where maybe it's a millimeter. You get about 30,000 volts per centimeter. So squeeze it down. He says that arcs over at about 3,000 volts. I don't have uh, power amplifiers that are going to gener generate more than 3,000 volts at the base of my tower. So I gap it down, and Mr. Lightning comes down. He jumps from the tower to the grounding system. Once an arc starts, the voltage between the two electrodes is very small compared to the our, uh, voltage that made it arc, and it'll stay small until the current gets so low that the arc cannot continue to sustain itself. Then the quench of the arc, it goes back to whatever voltage is still there. But I assure you it's a lot lower than what caused it to arc in the first place. So it can be very simple. You don't have to buy expensive stuff. I talk about single point ground panel uh, for your station. This is a, a typical kind of a recommendation. This is not an instruction for you to go home and drill holes so things look just like this. Get a, a panel of aluminum or a panel of copper. You can buy them commercially. You can make one. Put it on the outside of your house where your cables come in. Separate the cables into protected and unprotected zones. Do not lump them together even though the bundle looks nice and neat. You don't want to give lightning a path around your grounding panel. So have your bundle of protecteds and your bundle of unprotecteds, okay? Um, what's on there at the left, the PLDO is called a protected line duplex outlet. Basically, it's just an AC outlet with a bunch of inductors and MOVs and stuff inside that clamp any surges or transients. And then you power all of your gear off of that protected line. You can buy them with two, line, uh, two outlets, uh, six outlets. You can buy them in a wide range of stuff. Um, Isobar makes them. They're available uh, online. Then you have your coax lightning arresters with the little gas discharge tubes in them. A number of vendors sell those. And your telco or your rotator protector uh, in another little box. And all of these things, all of their ground connections are mounted onto this same panel. So they have a very low impedance, direct, short connection. Everybody's going up and down together. And then there's a big connection to your earthing perimeter ground system. And then there's another big connection to your RF ground plane or, or bonding bus inside the shack that we're going to talk about in a minute. Remember to keep the protected stuff away from the unprotected stuff. This is at the outside of your house. Here's some examples. This is the PLDO, protected line duplex outlet. Polyphaser sells one of those. There's one over here on the right for data and telephone communication. It's got gas discharge tubes and MOVs in it. And then down here are some typical lightning protectors. And the lightning protectors, some of them have capacitors in them. Those cause the gas discharge tube to fire a little quicker, but they also block DC. So if you are sending DC along your power lines out to a control box, relay box, or something, uh, or even AC, low frequency AC, make sure you get the right kind of uh, lightning protector or your system will stop working and you'll wonder why. It's because of that ca series capacitor that blocks it. Here's some examples. This is from my uh, Crawford County Cumulonimbus Discharge Facility. I have three layers of uh, lightning protection in my system. And, and each one has a single point ground panel. This is the big one. It's in the barn. I figure if we're going to burn something down, let's burn down the barn, okay? So here's, here's my hard lines that to the left, they go to the house where the station is. To the right, they go to the three towers. You can see it's on a big panel of aluminum. It's just flashing, roofing flashing, got it at Home Depot. You can see the ground wire in the middle, the big copper looking thing, bolted onto that panel and it comes down to a ground rod right there in the barn. And then... Each one of the rotators has a, I use irrigation cable, cheap and available, uh, tin conductor number 16. I double up two of the number 16s for the heavy lines. And after this picture was taken, each one of these positions on the terminal strip has a small gas discharge tube that is connected from the terminal strip to the grounding panel. So the rotator is protected and the RF lines are protected. This is what's at the base of the tower. 
We use an RCS4L. If you buy these remote switches and they have an L at the end of the number, that's a lightning protection, a lightning protected switch, and they have little gas discharge tubes inside them. Um, and then on the right is a rotator um, control cable terminal strip, and you can see the little gas discharge tubes. They cost maybe a buck. You buy them a, in a bag of 100 or 200 from Mauser, um, and they're like candy. You can just use them everywhere. Okay, that's at the base of every tower. You can see the piece of aluminum flashing, and you can see the big ground connection that goes to my tower ground system. All I did was pound in a T-post, a couple of T-posts, mounted a surplus um, uh, fiberglass NEMA box on it, shoved this stuff inside it. That's what's at the base of each tower. This is K4RO's tower. Remember how I told you some guys are always losing equipment to lightning. Kirk said, every time a thunderstorm came through, I'd lose something. I'd lose a switch. I'd lose a router. I'd lose blah, 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 blah. Well, he got mad, and he went into his garage. The shack is directly above this, so he's got like a second floor shack, and he took a big panel of aluminum, and he mounted everything that has to do with the antenna system on that panel. You can see his filters, his matchbox, his uh, preamps, everything. You can see the ground lead up at the upper right that goes outside, one big number six stranded, goes to a big ground rod outside the house. He says, I haven't lost one piece of equipment since, not one. And he's gotten hammered by some storms. Ron Blocks, in his article, will talk to you about lightning protection. And uh, every he talks about con connecting things together in a protected zone. The red line up there shows you a protected zone. Everything you want to protect has to be in that zone. And every wire that crosses the boundary must have some kind of mitigation against arcs and sparks. You have to protect it. Even one wire that's not protected that comes in there will act, that'll be the one. That'll be the one where the surge comes in and causes the transient. So you just have to make a list, make a drawing, tie it all together. He goes into great detail about this. Read the article. Inside your shack, this is the standard um, drawing that you've seen in the handbook for many years. It's been updated. Uh, use that copper pipe, whatever. You got your piece of surplus copper. It's your grounding bus in the back of the equipment. All the equipment is tied together um, to the bonding bus with ground clamps, or you can use sheet metal screws that go into the pipe and, you know, crimp terminals. Uh, even tie stuff together like antenna switches that don't have power to them. Bond everything together using this bond, strap, uh, bond bus and then a big piece of strap to your single point ground panel. You've got to remember that everything in your station is part of the antenna system. Every stinking thing. I mean, your 40 meter antenna, you're in the near field of that antenna, okay? So every piece of wire in your station is part of the antenna system, everything. Your lightning protection ground, your ground rod, you are part of it. Um, power supplies, radios, the whole thing, okay? So you have to treat every piece of wire as something that's gonna have RF on it one way or the other. So forget about the RF ground thing. There's no magic connection that you can make that's, a, huh, got it, we're all at zero volts now, my job is done. No, uh, back in the day when we all operated on 40 or 80 CW and we put a ground rod outside or we connected to the copper pipe or something like that, that was sort of sufficient for a simple station. These days with more sophisticated connections, lots of equipment, you wanna do this right. So bond it together. Bond, 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 bond. If you equalize voltage, you minimize current. You get rid of those hot spots. No one has really gotten their amateur license until they got bit on the lip by a metal microphone, okay? I mean, that's your real initiation right, isn't it? Okay. Eliminate those hot spots. Those hot spots occur because everything is not tied together. It's hot in a spot because it's not tied to everything else. You want everything to go up and down together. It reduces RFI from these common mode currents flowing on audio cables and microphones and stuff. 
It re reduces the sensitivity to figure configuration. Remember, all of us have had this situation where if I operate on 15, I have to move this over here and I have to disconnect this wire. I can't operate with this cable hooked up on 15 meters. That's because of RF being induced in the station wiring and current flowing back and forth. And this also gets rid of audio buzz and hum, which is very, very important because we're now doing digital modes that use very low level audio into and out of the microphone circuit. If you contaminate that with noise or buzz or hum, that's going to hurt the ability of the software to pull out those weak signals. Keep your cables short. <clears throat> If, I know you go down to the store, you want to buy a USB cable, the shortest one you can find is like six feet, okay? If you've got to have long cables, coil them up and keep them on top of your ground connections. Lay them on top of the bonding bus. Try to keep all that stuff together. Not only does it look neater, it minimizes the loop area. And the amount of voltage induced in a loop is directly proportional to its area. If you minimize the area, you minimize the voltage. This is what I do. I went down to Costco, I bought some tables, and I put a piece of flashing on them in the back, and I just went pew, 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 pew with sheet metal screws. Do not try this in your wife's grandmother's table that she got from the antique store, okay? All right, but it works okay in a Costco plastic table. I just laid the flashing on it. I, so now I have this great big ground plane under all my equipment. And so when the RF comes in and the wave comes in, what does it see? It sees one big short circuit. All of that equipment is at the same voltage. I've got my copper pipe in the back. You can see the little screw terminals every so often and a nice little short ground connection that goes from the radio to the grounding bus and down at the bottom there in the left, you can see the big ass grounding conductor that goes to my single point ground panel. My single point ground in my station is actually a rack. I've got a six foot rack with all of my switching and amplifiers and everything is in that rack, metal, and it's all bonded together. And then one big cable goes outside to the ground system. But whatever you use as a single point ground, make sure all your equipment's bonded together. That includes the computer, your uh, radios, your antenna switches, everything, and then one big connection out to the ground system. Now. You guys are going, this is going to cost a fortune. I don't, I've already spent all my money. I'm here at Dayton. I'm going to buy that radio and try to sneak it back into the house. I told Janet at HRO that she ought to have a, a spray dust can, you know, so you get it back into the house and you spray dust all over it, you know. So your spouse comes in and goes, where the hell is that from? You go, look, it's been here for years, you know. <laughs> There's a story going around about a guy whose spouse didn't understand the radios but she could count knobs. And so she would go in and count all the knobs, and when he came back from a hand fest, yeah, yeah I, these guys are gone. No, fair, right. And she would count the knobs, and if it didn't have the same number of knobs, he wouldn't buy it, because he knew that he would get busted when he got home. Okay. Ah, there you go. Well, see, totally busted forever. What are you gonna do? Okay. One system will rule them all to steal the line from uh, the ring. Okay, you make one good solid ground system. It solves all of these requirements if you do it right. Uh, if you're rebuilding, you're just starting, whatever, do it once, do it right. And remember, all currents flow on all wires. Mr. Lightning isn't going to come in and go, oh, I can't fly on that wire because it's an AC safety wire or it's an RF connection. No, he will flow on everything. RF will flow on everything. AC will flow on everything. So make one good solid system with all the right parts and pieces and you won't have to do it again. It solves all of your requirements at once. This is kind of the overview of what it's supposed to look like. You got your tower out there. You got your grounding at the base of the tower. Maybe you got some radials. You bond the tower to your perimeter ground that goes around the house. People say, how far does the tower have to be before I don't bond it? Um, if you look at the standards, anything up to 200 feet, they, re they require you to bond stuff together. The military says 200 feet. Some of the commercial standards are more like 50. But it doesn't hurt anything. The problem is your bonding wire gets so long that the inductance makes it useless at lightning uh, frequencies. But 
bond it all together. Can you use the shields of your feed lines? Yes, but you have to verify that they're all solid. And what happens if you disconnect a feed line that was serving as your ground connection between uh, two spots? So use a bonding conductor. You don't have to worry about it. You got your single point grounding panel. You got your AC power panel. Inside you have an, an RF bonding bus. Everything's tied together. It all goes up together and down together. This is in the book, um, and these slides will be online. Basically, it shows a schematic for taking one of those protected outlets, where all your ground connections are, and how you, you use um, protected AC outlets elsewhere in your shack. So you can make a great big uh, protected uh, power strip out of the heavy-duty stuff if you want for yourself. Here's your additional resources. National Fire Protection Association, they're the NEC publishers. They have a lot of good app notes and stuff. International Association of Electrical Inspectors, uh, they have training materials for inspectors. If nothing else, you can find out what the inspectors are going to try to bust you for, okay? So you can go in and, and learn what they're looking for. They are looking for certain things. So do those things. Mike Holt Enterprises is a resource training, continuing education for electricians, lots and lots of tutorials, practice tests, drawings. Uh, Polyphaser has tons of stuff. Their white papers are still out there uh, with all this stuff on lightning protection. And they have some stuff that's specifically for hams. Lightning Protection Institute has a bunch more stuff too. Here's the standards, FAA document on practices and procedures for lightning. IEEE standard 1100, that's not cheap, but you can get it through interlibrary loan. And Mill Handbook 419 is also online, and uh, that's the big military uh, standard. I had a I report that at an IEEE conference, a guy uh, went and was giving a talk on EMC. He held up two books. One was Mill 419, and the other was my stupid little grounding and bonding book for the radio amateur. I mean... All right, and you know the ultimate validation is when you publish something like this and the electricians don't jump on you every chance that they get. The electricians love the book. I don't know how I managed to do that. It was all my reviewers and you know all these guys that helped me keep from doing stupid stuff. So hopefully we've started to collect this kind of material together to help you do the right job once with reasonable amount of material and confidence that you've done it. So basically, that, uh, oh, here's some books. R.R. Block, The Grounds is out there. Um, this RAND book is, if you really want to get into it, read the RAND book. And the ARL uh, Technical Information Service, Electrical Safety, Grounding, and Lightning Protection. Tom, W.H.J.I., has a great website on it. Just Google W.H.J.I. Uh, ground, and you'll find it. Lots of good drawings and stuff. Are we done yet? Yes, we're done. Thank you so much. I have time for questions. Huh, questions? I can't believe it. Yes. Uh, someone I know has an artificial ground that they got from the FJ. It seems to work well. Can you comment? Um, a friend of his has an artificial ground. You've seen these systems. MFJ sells one. Well, first of all, it's not a ground. Okay, what it is, it's like putting a weight on your tire. What it does is unbalance your system at the point at which you connect it to create a low impedance. At the end of the wire that, uh, that the artificial ground is connected to that you adjust or switch, that's a pretty high voltage spot. So what it's done is move a high voltage spot out to the end of the wire. Pro tip, do not put counterpoises under your station where you can step on them in bare feet. Don't ask me how I know that. Okay. But all that is is a weight on your tire. Other question? Yes, sir. That was an insulated base tower. Okay, so basically he just created a spark gap. Uh, the rest of the base of the tower is really grounded. Yes. Oh, the whole house surge protectors, those work for AC transient stuff. That, and there's a difference between way, the way the AC people talk about common mode and the way we do. Common mode to them means hot and neutral, and they don't care about ground. We care about ground. Yeah. 
oh, the protected line duplex outlet. No, they do not. They will help, but, um, and, and um, they will protect a lot of the stuff in your house. But for things that are all connected to antenna systems and things like that that go outside, you need the extra level of protection. Yes? I'm sorry, how? how Okay, uh, how important is it for the length? Oh, to measure the impedance. Um, well, how are you going to measure it? You're going to measure it at DC, you're going to measure it at AC, you're going to, you know, it's a wide spectrum thing. The rules that are out there have been devised so that they work with high confidence over a wide range of applications. So if you follow those rules, you'll have the same confidence that it will work. You could probably devise something in your specific circumstances that would work a little better or a whole lot worse. Um, but there's no real point to it unless you have extraordinarily unusual circumstances. Follow the main recommendations and you'll accomplish what you need to accomplish almost all the time. You know, I wish... We all like to optimize things, you know, and engineers love optimizing things, but this is a very hard problem. Yes? My car has a totally fiberglass body. What do I do with my mobile antenna? His car has a fiberglass body. What does he do with a mobile antenna? Um, you can use on glass, um, uh, whips and stuff like that. Uh, typically, someplace is a metal chassis that holds it all together, although I think Tesla is probably you know, working on a foam car at this point. But find that, that bonding chassis, uh, like a trailer hitch or something like that, and connect to that. That's pretty much all you got. Or you can put something underneath like a trunk lid, like a big piece of metal, and, and you know, use that as your ground plane. You can put radials under a VHF stuff. That's about all I got for you. Yeah. Um, the ground radial for your tower. Now you were saying about 30 feet. I've also been told that they should be as long as the tower is high. Is there a, a diminishing return? 30 feet is a point of diminishing returns. And there's a lot of mythology about, uh, you know, the ball, if you could roll a ball up to your tower and that would, the cone of protection and all that. And they're really finding that's not really the case. 30 feet is a minimum. Uh, if you have longer ones, they'll work on the low bands as your ground radial system. I think we're probably about out of time when people with purple shirts show up. So corner me outside, get the book, whatever. Um, thanks for your attention.